So welcome everybody and thank you very much for joining us uh, here today. A reminder that today's program is being recorded um, and that recording has started. Um, today's program is called Taking Back Water Rights with Maud Barlow and Tina O. Oh. My name is Shannon and I work for Halifax Public Libraries and we're also joined by library staff member Tanya. So as we join this session virtually, we may be in different geographical locations. I know our speakers are in different locations as many attendees may be. We wish to begin today's session by acknowledging the indigenous lands that we occupy. So I and Halifax Public Libraries are in Mi'kmaq. We live, work, and play on ancestral land that belongs to the Mi'kmaq people, the first peoples of Nova Scotia. We recognize and respect them as the first peoples in this territory, as well as their historic connection to the lands and waters around us since time immemorial. We must look to indigenous leadership and stewardship as we work toward a better climate future together. We remember that we are all treaty people and that those of us who are non-Indigenous each have an individual responsibility to acknowledge and address the centuries of injustice, suffering, environmental degradation, and broken promises that resulted from European settlement. So before the program begins, uh, I'll remind everybody this is a Zoom webinar that is being recorded. So it will be available afterwards on the library website to view. So what this means is that you can see and hear us, but we cannot see and hear you. If you need to adjust your audio settings, you can do so by hovering over the microphone at the bottom of the Zoom window where you should see a small arrow if you click that, it will allow you to adjust your speaker settings as well as whatever settings you have on your individual devices. Most tech problems can be solved if you close the webinar or leave entirely and then rejoin. But if you do have any specific issues, you can use the chat function. And Tanya from the library will be monitoring the chat and can support with any tech issues or if you have any questions, she is available to help. There will be a question period toward the end of the program. So if you have any questions you'd like to direct to our wonderful knowledgeable speakers, you can do so using the Q&A function, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. Here you'll be able to enter both your own questions as well as upvote or like any questions that others are posing. Joining us today, we have, as I said, Maud Barlow and Tina O. Oh. Maud Barlow is the author of 17 books, including the best-selling Blue Water Trilogy. She is the co-founder of the Council of Canadians and of the Washington-based Food and Water Watch. She is also a board member of the International Forum on Globalization and a counselor with the World Future Council. In 2008 to 9, she served as the first senior advisor on water to the 63rd president of the UN General Assembly and was a leader in the campaign to have water recognized as a human right by the UN. She lives in Ottawa, Ontario. Tina Yeonjun Oh is a Korean immigrant that grew up in Alberta, where it took her family over 13 years to gain permanent residency status. Tina is based in Halifax, where she works as a labor organizer, as well as a migrant justice organizer with No One Is Illegal Halifax. She is the training manager for a coalition of Black and Indigenous youth heading to the United Nations climate change negotiations in Glasgow, Scotland. The aim of the coalition is to pressure Canadian governments to standards of climate justice and historic reparations. O was featured by CBC as 13 Canadian environmentalists and innovators changing earth for the better. She was named Canada's top 25 environmentalists under 25 by Starfish Canada and was a recipient of the 2018 David Brower Awards in California for her fossil fuel divestment activism. So thank you, Maude and Tina for joining us and I will turn it over to you. 
Thank you so much, Shannon. Uh, it is amazing to be here and to be in the presence of Maud Barlow. And I just on a very personal note, Maud, uh, just wanted to say that my activism is very much um, on the basis of the work that you've done and that I am very much on the shoulders of giants here. So Thank welcome. You. How lovely. <clears throat> Thank you, Tina, very, very much. And I just want to say hello to everybody. I live in Ottawa, the uh, unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe, um, but I'm originally from the Halifax area. I spent my early years in Digby, so um, <clears throat> a real shout out to uh, all my friends in Atlantic Canada. And um, what you need to know is that Tina is in uh, Scotland right now in Glasgow at the COP COP26 and I am dying to know how it goes. I know you're supposed to be asking me questions, but you were in the march yesterday. Was it fabulous? Yes, the march was incredible. We had the global uh, climate march yesterday where I walked alongside hundreds, hundreds of thousands of, you know, my brothers, sisters, relations. Um, we marched through the streets of Glasgow and uh, we sent a message as to to the world as to why we're here at COP26 in Glasgow, uh, pushing for real solutions, real reductions uh, to a 1.5 degree world. Um, so yes, would be happy to talk more about that, but of course the center of the stage is you and um, I would love to get started um, and we'll, we'll just organically kind of go back and forth. But um, Mon, my first question really is, I would love to know, um, just exactly how how did you get to kind of where you are today? How did what involved you into the movement for water justice? Um, you know, CBC calls you Canada's best known voice of dissent. Uh, how did you get to where you are today? Well, I <clears throat> came out of the women's movement, like a lot of people in my generation that are <clears throat> doing other kinds of work. We started uh, with the, the women's movement, and I've just finished writing a new book on hope, and I did a whole section on my time in the women's movement, the earlier years, and just looking back on what life was like then for women, I, it's just, I was forgetting. I grew up in the 50s and 60s in, in Ottawa, and uh, my mother couldn't get a driver's license or um, uh, a bank account or get a, a visa to travel without my father's signature. I mean, things have changed a lot, and which is one of my messages, of course, of hope is that things do change and we can change them for the better. And then along came uh, something called the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement in the mid 1980s and Ronald Reagan was the president of the United States. And we had a brand new Ronald Reagan type, <clears throat> Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan type in uh, Brian Mulroney who became the, the prime minister of Canada. And they dreamed up this first of the new modern free trade agreements which isn't really about trade and goods. It's really about dramatically reducing the amount of space governments have in which to move and opening up and giving everything over to the to private sector, private interests, financial interests, big corporations. And I was worried about social programs, particularly healthcare as it relates to women. And that's how I got involved in the fight in the first place. <clears throat> the one day I'm sitting down reading the Canada US Free Trade Agreement and I look at the annex at the end, which lists all of the goods that are going to be subject to the new rules of the trade agreement and like running shoes and what are they going to do about cars and so on and these you know, when the rules are the rules are very strict it means that governments really are saying our hands are off these these listed goods and there was water in all its forms including ice and snow <clears throat> and i can tell you <clears throat> tina i sat down and said i don't understand water i'd never thought of water it comes out of the tap i'm clean it's clean i'm grateful i knew that and i knew it wasn't like that for everyone but i i you know i hadn't put my my toe in if you will and that started me on a journey because i thought how can that be and i started to realize um which i learned learned quite quickly that we are a planet running out of clean water um, in spite of many good positive things that are happening we still have about 2.2 billion people every year or every day who don't have access to clean drinking water and over half the population of the entire planet doesn't have a place to wash their hands with soap and warm water doesn't have sanitation i mean those numbers are stunning and they're not going down they're going up because we have what i call the perfect storm or the triple threat of it growing inequality not just between and among nations but within countries 
um, a cl a class differences, and we have uh, rising water prices, often due to privatization, and then we have declining water sources. I mean, we are depleting, polluting, over extracting water, damming our rivers to get to death, taking water from where it was put by nature and diverting it to where we want for our pleasure, convenience and profit, right? And so I began to understand that there was what I called a mighty contest going on. And I can tell you now, I believe that the corporate sector knew before any of us that a planet running out of clean water where the demand is going straight up and the supply is going straight down, there was, there was going to be a mighty contest and there was going to be a contest for who controls it, who makes decisions about it. And so I helped build with many, many others, um, a movement in this country and a movement globally to, to what we should call a water justice, global water justice movement, to say that water is not a commodity, should not be put on the open market for sale like oil and gas, that it is in fact a commons, a public trust, a public service and a human right. And so we just dove right into the, just to keep the water metaphor into the deep end of the pool on this thing with just saying, we have to build a movement based on these values. And in a way, uh, Tina, it was really interesting because it brought me back to the women's movement because of course, in many places, particularly in the global South, <clears throat> water is a woman, women's issue. It's, you know, the women are responsible for getting it, finding it, watering the gardens, growing the food, the health care of the family. The girls are taken out of school because it's dangerous if there's not private sanitation and they go to walk with their mothers for the water. So it's very, very much a women's issue. And in the, the so-called first world as well, where in the United States every year, about 15 million people have their water cut off because they can't afford to pay. So it's not, well, I don't want us to think about this it's just far away. So the journey started there, Tina, and it's taken me to every interesting place to do with water from chasing the bad guys at the world future, the World Water Forum. They have these World Water Council. The council, I mean, has these forums every three years and it's just all high technology and technology and privatization will save the world, just chasing the trade agreements that continue to promote the trade in water, um, to linking it very, very strongly to the climate crisis that we have, and then working with and among some of the poorest people in the world and just building this movement that um, has just transformed my life. It, it's been a wonderful, wonderful uh, gift, but it started coming out of a concern around women. Uh, and uh, continued with the fight against economic globalization and privatization, financialization of the economy, financialization of nature and so on. So yeah, it was uh, literally a what, what kind, what are, what movement moment, like just what does that mean? How can that be? So yeah, it, it's been an exciting journey. Wow, Maude, thank you so much for sharing. I I have some sh like goosebumps around my arms just um, in comparison to kind of what I'm witnessing here at COP26 in Glasgow. Um, just you've hit home around um, a lot of the conversations around trade agreements, uh, the growing corporatization, the influence that big oil, big corporations are having at these climate negotiations. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of the parallels there and that, you know, this is a fight that we we're in for the very long run and, and that it's been happening for a very long time. Um, something that I also wanted to pull out too is I find it extremely fascinating and I, and I think the, the intersection between gender and, and water rights um, that you just mentioned um, is so critical. We're seeing that in Jabukduk in Halifax where um, the Mi'kmaq women um, have, have led the resistance against Alton Gas, have won have won that resistance um, and have been protecting the waters there. Um, and so, of course, definitely it is women that are leading this fight, um, women such as yourself. Um, one quote that I wanted to pull out, um, Ariel Deranger of Climate, Indigenous Climate Action has been talking about how uh, the COP negotiations are about trade agreements. Um, they're looking for a way to save the economy, not necessarily save the planet. Um, and so there's this major kind of conversation around carbon market mechanisms and how you know corporations are going to be involved in this fight towards um, you know uh, quote saving you know the world and of course that's not exactly what we're seeing. Could you maybe talk a little bit more about you know what those what the corporate influence has been around um, water as 
being seen as a commodity? Well, thank you so much for that. Obviously, wonderful connection to what's going on in Glasgow right now. It is just appalling to see the corporations, uh, you know, hosting this thing. I remember the 2009 <clears throat> COP in uh, Copenhagen. Uh, you were greeted at, as you got off the airplane by young people, you know, young women mostly, in little red outfits like little, little, little elves, handing you Coca-Cola. It was kind of like the COP brought, brought to you by Coke. And they had a very cute slogan, which was Copenhagen. And I started calling it Copenhagen because everywhere you went, there were videos and billboards of people running through grass and it was all clean water and everything brought to you by Coca-Cola. It's like something is profoundly wrong here. Of the hundred largest economies in the world, 69 are corporations. I mean, think about that. 31 are, in our, are nation states. Most of these big corporations are way bigger. They have a far bigger uh, profit, annual profit than the GDP of most countries. And so when they say to a country, we want to come in and extract your minerals, or we want to come in and mine for oil, or we want to do, we want um, uh, big ag to come in and, and take over your land because we want to feed our animals back home with on your land. Very, very many countries find themselves in a position where they just don't know how to say no. And then on top of that, you have trade agreements that give corporations the right to sue these governments if they allow, they begin to allow a negotiation and then say that's not working or you, you, you corporation violated the environmental or human rights of our people and they can be sued. And we know that there have been lawsuits against poorer countries of billions of dollars, just an absolutely outrageous thing. Um, although in some ways we're beginning to win that fight. I'm going to hold on to the, the hope that I, I'm, I'm feeling about uh, the knowledge here. And what it makes me happy, Tina, about what you're saying is that a number of people, and I know Ariel well, and I'm so pleased she's talking about trade because it's very important that your generation gets this. Sometimes when you're raised in something like trade, these trade agreements have been around a long time, you can kind of figure, well, it's done. There's nothing to be done about that. And we just have to live within that. But what I keep explaining to people is that these trade agreements are treaties that supersede your domestic law. And so they, you know, if you want to, you want this and this and this, for instance, to take action on climate, there are corporations ready to say, you can't do that because you have a trade agreement that allowed me to come in when your re regulations were here. Now you're changing your regulations and, 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 and bringing them up here and you, you can do it but you have to pay me compensation. And sometimes it's in the billions, certainly in the millions, but often in the billions of dollars. So we fought this on the, on the water side. And I just wanna say first, just before I address that, Tina, is that the water issue, <clears throat> while it's deeply part of the climate issue is also separate because we tend to think about greenhouse gas emission, uh, climate chaos crisis causing drought causing water problems. And yes, it does. It causes rise of warming of the oceans. It causes warming of the lakes and rivers, which is more um, uh, uh, evaporation. Uh, it, it, it's melting glaciers. It, you know, we know all that is thirsty, thirsty plants and thirsty forests uh, need more water. So yes, climate change impacts water. But when we remove water or vegetation from a local hydrologic cycle, we negatively impact not only that local hydrologic cycle, because literally the rain goes away, but we impact climate. And, and the way we abuse water is one of the major causes of climate chaos, the climate crisis. And, and one of the major solutions is the protection and restoration of watersheds, as, as we know as forests and wetlands and healthy soils. I mean, these are all incredibly important parts of the story. So when I think, because I think, I find it important to say that if we were able to end every greenhouse gas emission in the world tomorrow, we would still have a uh, water crisis and it's a huge human, human rights uh, crisis. So yes, we've been fighting the corporations. There are basically, there's basically a continuum. So the, one, the first level that we started fighting was 1987 when Margaret Thatcher privatized, actually sold the whole water system in England and Wales to private companies and they rue the day that that happened in that country. The companies dump their garbage in the, in the rivers. They don't pay taxes. They pay their CEOs in exorbitant prices. It, it's just a, a, an outrage, right? Then the World Bank started to say, well, that's a good model. So what we're going to say to, to poorer countries of the global south, if you're seeking funding from the World Bank, you're going to have to 
um, uh, uh, come up with a, a either you find a private uh, company or we will, and they will you know, introducing what they call public private partnerships, um, and and force privatization on many many municipalities around the world. Now the good news on that is that there's been a huge fight back, and there are something I think the latest stats are something like 337 municipalities, including big ones like Berlin and Paris, big ones that tried privatization, realized it was a mistake and have gone back to public management. Then you get what, uh, what I, water markets and water trading. And that's where the water is separated from the land and sold as a private commodity. And the two, the three places in the world that's happening the most is Chile, which started with Pinochet, the dreadful dictator who totally completely privatized water, not only water services, but he allowed the big companies, foreign companies to come in and bid for water against local indigenous communities, farmers and so on. And they just literally bought the water rights. Um, Australia has separated their water from the land because they have severe drought and they thought, well, maybe the farmers would save water a little bit because if they could use less, they could sell the extra. And it didn't work, of course. Big farmers came in, bought the little farmers out. Then the investors came in. Then the foreign investors came in. And then the price went up through the roof. Um, but this is a very dangerous form of water privatization. And you also see it, or water commodification, you also see it when a big mining company or a big agribusiness company comes in and gets a lease in, a, in the country of the global south, usually um, for 50, 60, 100 years. They own that land, they own that water, they can do whatever they want with it. The more recent one that we're really worried about is called the financialization of water. And that's where the Chicago Mercantile Exchange a few months ago allowed for the first time, it's a commodities exchange, right? But they can called water a commodity and they're allowing speculation on water futures, which means that it's starting in California, which as you know, is in crisis. So, okay, I'm a rich investor, or I'm a great big agribusiness company, or I'm one of these equity funds that nobody knows who owns them. It's just, you know, all this global atmosphere sort of thing. I can go, I can, I, I know more droughts coming because I can see it and I've got experts who can tell me. So I'm gonna buy water futures. You're not buying the actual water, you're buying the asset at this price. And I just hold on to it for a few years and I'll get rich. And these people have the nerve to say they're doing it in the name of conservation, right? So this has been, a, a, as I said earlier, a mighty contest. Um, we are, we have put together a very powerful movement um, around the world to fight it, but it's, you know, it's exactly what you're seeing at COP26, which is the big banks coming in, the big big poobahs coming in and saying, oh, you know, we've got Mark Carney coming in and saying that he's harnessed all this money. Well, what the power that these corporations are going to have and these private financial institutions on setting government policy when they hold the, the purse strings for how these countries are going to deal with the climate crisis. So it, yes, I'm seeing, watching COP26, I'm, it's just like deja vu all over again, as they say. Um, but with the knowledge that we have, that we learn, you know, I, one of the things I say in my, my new book is that it's not, you can't think of this as, did I win that particular fight? Mm -hmm. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't, or maybe we did, and that's great. <clears throat> but if we didn't, that's okay too, because we brought new people in and we educated each other. We're building a movement and that movement is wonderful. You don't know where the success is going to come from. Uh, Rebecca Solnit, who wrote a wonderful book called um, Hope in the Dark, says progress isn't an army moving forward. She says it's a crab moving sideways, you know, and you don't know when it's going to come at you. And I find, I just find this, what we're learning, what you guys, when I mean, say that, I mean young people, um, Indigenous uh, teachings, I just think the, the world is, is hearing new voices in a an incredibly powerful way. And, and I find that's the glass half full or three quarters full for me. Yes, yes. And sorry, Ma, that's beautiful way to um, kind of encapsulate this gigantic crisis that we're in, these crises, these compounding crises that we're in. Um, I loved how you just talk about also um, the connections. And I think a lot of young folks have a lot to learn around that too, is that um, 
we're seeing kind of the most pressing issue, at least for young folks, is, is you know, the climate change, the climate crisis burden, but that the water crisis is actually perpetuating it. Um, and it is one of the leading factors of that. Um, and then also, of course, you know, talking about hope, uh, Rebecca Solnit's book is always, you know, a, a, a Bible to me in a way, uh, because like you said, we're building a movement and that the winds might happen down the, ro down the road and uh, we won't exactly know um, until they happen, but uh, they're just certainly happening as we're pulling more and more folks in. And I'm seeing that here at COP26 too, it's that, um, I mean, this is my fourth uh, COP and I'm sure you've been to, to tons more than I have, but um, certainly this is the first COP where I'm seeing, you know, human rights and indigenous rights as a forefront, as a narrative and as a mainstream narrative. So I am seeing the changes happening. I am seeing some hope there. Um, and so it's, it's really brilliant for me to hear you say too that um, you're seeing that happen over, you know, your lifetime of activism. Um, to just kind of pull back a little bit um, and maybe even just on a very basic term, um, Maud, could you talk a little bit more about just why is it so dangerous to have, you know, this privatization of, of water? Like I, I, I think people generally know why, you know, that that's dangerous and you've talked a lot about the corporatization, the profit mechanisms, but um, in Canada right now where you know water has remained largely in public hands what is the danger of us moving towards a system where water is becoming privatized well we have <clears throat> had a pretty proud heritage of public water management in this country there have been experiments such as hamilton which realized it was a mistake and went back st john new brunswick has privatized a part of its wastewater system and there was a big fight around that and we're hopeful that when that contract ends, that will end. But mostly in Canada, <clears throat> local groups, um, Water Watch groups, CUPE, Council of Canadians groups have come together to say, you just can't have this happen. And the Indigenous voices have been extremely uh, vocal and extremely important around this. Look, if there was all the water that we were all told existed, maybe it would be different, but we don't. And it's very important for Canadians to know that we have a crisis too. I wrote another book, this one on, on water in, in Canada. It's called Gover uh, Boiling Point, Government Neglect, Corporate Abuse and Canada's Water Crisis. And people say, what water crisis? We've got a quarter of the world's water. That is just so wrong. We only have 25% of the world or 20% of the world's water. If we were to drain every lake and river, we have about 6.5% of the available accessible water. That's the water you can use without hurting the, 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 the basic stock, right? It's really important for us to understand that <clears throat> we are polluting <clears throat> many, many of our rivers with and, and lakes with um, blue-green algae and Lake Winnipeg, which is the 10th largest lake in the world is some summers absolutely devastatingly sick with the blue-green algae and eutrophication coming from the hog farms and others. We have very strong laws now around human waste and the government, the federal government has brought in new rules for, that municipalities have to upgrade to, to meet. But we have no rules <clears throat> around, <clears throat> excuse me, around, um, around what's coming off the, the factory farms. And I, in one paragraph, I just describe what's in some of the stuff coming off these farms. Of course, it's all the, the nitrates and the, and the hormones and the, 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 you know, the sewage and everything put together. And it just gets dumped in many, many cases right smack into our rivers. There was a study a couple of years ago that 246 major lakes in Canada are seriously contaminated with blue-green algae. And of course, we've got the issues we know about. I'm um, in the Great Lakes. We had drought on the prairies this summer. We had drought in British Columbia. And as the late great uh, David Schindler said, this is not, this isn't a, a, a rotational thing and it's gonna be drought one year and, and lots of rain the next. I mean, although we do know that that cycle is, is more extreme under climate change, but he said, we are headed for permanent drought uh, from the West on. And I would even say in parts of Ontario and Quebec, um, we were experiencing that this summer. We must get over what I call the myth of abundance that we have <clears throat> so much water in Canada. We don't have to worry about it. We can dump whatever we want into the groundwater. You know, we can use as much as we want. We can move it from wherever it, we, to wherever we want it from where nature put it. 
Um, the glaciers are melting in our country. We have very serious issues. And as, Tina, as there are going to be refugees, whether they're migrants from free, fleeing violence or starvation or drought, uh, you know, the lack of water, there are going to be people coming to this country. And we have a responsibility to take care of this water. Now, how do you care for a heritage that you've been so lucky to have, have been gifted with? while well, you do it by taking care of it and you don't take care of it if you give it to private sector interests whose bottom line has to be the most important thing. I mean, you can be a business person and have ethics and not want to externalize your environmental costs and you want to pay your, your employees properly and all of that. <clears throat> but if you're competing in the open market against a similar country company <clears throat> selling something similar, but they're not obeying any of that and they dump their toxins and they go to low wage countries and they hire kids and they don't care. You can't compete because bottom line is people want the cheaper good. And so we need the rule of law. And that's, I love the quote from Martin Luther King that um, legislation may not change the heart but it will restrain the heartless. I love that. I think it's just beautiful. We need good law. We need the rule of law. Um, and when we don't have it, then it's a free for all. They call it the dead hand of the market. So then you've got corporations even ones who might not want to do that, having to compete uh, to, by the lowest common denominator. Um, and so it's very important to keep um, particularly the um, delivery of water and wastewater services in public hands, and it needs to be transparent. People need to be able to see it. We now have study after study after study that shows us that when water, municipal water services are privatized, they um, <clears throat> cut the workers, Often they lay off, but they don't want unionized workers. They want them non-unionized. They cut corners. They no longer take care of the water source itself. Um, they raise the price of water, sometimes like right away. It's like, oops, did we sign a contract last week saying this is what we would, you know, we would be charging people? We're so sorry. We just discovered that we have to double that or maybe triple that. Those numbers, when, when Margaret Thatcher privatized England's Water, you can't imagine how fast the prices went up. It was just unbelievable. So, or all those things together. And so many, many municipalities say this is just a terrible mistake. So it's been very exciting in this country to, 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 to have a fight against that. And I just want to <clears throat> put a pitch for something that we, when I was with the Council of Canadians and the Canadian Union of Public Employees, when Stephen Harper was first uh, prime minister, he brought in a rule similar to the World Bank giving uh, grants to the Global South. He said to any municipality that wanted to upgrade its, its um, uh, infrastructure or they need new infrastructure because they're growing, had to ha take in a public-private partnership. They, had, they, could not, they would not get federal funding unless they moved to a public-private partnership. So we held a big conference in 2009 and we um, launched something we call Blue Communities. And Blue Communities is a pledge by a municipality. And by the way, it's grown. So universities have become Blue Communities and some labor unions and some faith-based groups. But a municipality pledges to protect and promote water as a human right, to protect and promote water <clears throat> as a public trust. Therefore, they will not privatize. And to phase out bottled water on municipal uh, premises, at conferences, uh, concerts and so on that they will have a campaign <clears throat> to promote public water um, and it's been incredibly um, successful we've had uh, um, many many municipalities in in Canada most recently London um, Vancouver and Montreal are three of the most recent but it's also spread to Europe so that Berlin became a blue community after privatizing fighting with a referendum to get their water back in public hands, they decided never again, they became a blue community. Many, many municipalities in France, where they, they um, had always had private services, they kicked them out and said, you're gone, we're, we're changing our minds. And Paris, I love Paris when they kicked the Suez and Veolia, the two big water companies up, they're both French companies, but big transnationals now. They, they set up a public water company and they called it Eau de Paris, which I think is quite lovely. And they have a lot of um, public education on why, why public water matters, why safe, clean drinking water there in Paris and around the world has got to be our goal. 
but it's it's a tough one because you'll get people saying well municipalities are cash strapped and you know we <clears throat> this money is very enticing uh you know when harper said we'll give you money for a public private partnership that was very enticing to cash strap municipalities so we it's a real it's a real struggle and i just want to add that it is not just the municipal services but it's keeping the decisions about water who has access to it who's dumping what into it you know this these issues matter um tremendously and oh by the way i wanted to say that if people are interested in um, working on a blue community in Halifax, there's going to be an open house November 13th from 2 to 4 at All Saints Cathedral. You can go to the local Council of Canadians website and find out because we're hoping Halifax will become a blue community. But it's really about, Tina, um, if it's true, and it is, that we are a planet running out of clean water. I mean, the water's still there somewhere, but if it's inaccessible or polluted or been, being used for something else, then then we have to have more democratic control and the more corporations control it the less democratic it is the less access you have to information the less control communities local communities have over that bottled water companies coming in here and going to drain that i don't think so whereas if it's all been privatized or it's all done behind closed doors or it's all protected by trade agreements it's really hard for ordinary people Indigenous communities, rural communities, anybody um, to, to protect their water sources and to protect the species that depend because we're not the only species that that uh, depends on on clean water. Of course, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Maud, um, so much. Um, actually, what, what you're talking about uh, essentially is is the blue communities campaign which is you know a people power driven campaign it's ordinary people fighting for you know the the right for the water to be within public hands um and i'd love to talk a little bit more about that because of course halifax is not yet committed to be a blue communities um uh, city but of course it sounds like there is the momentum towards going there how did how did the blue how did you start the blue communities campaign where did that idea come from what's the theory of change there well <clears throat> we launched it in 2009 with the canadian union of public employees at a great big conference in ottawa on all the ways in which water was being privatized commodified uh financialized <clears throat> and we just i remember giving a keynote saying these are all the ways that it's happening and people were just like yikes and so we decided rather than to be against everything because you know in our movement we're against a lot of things it we wanted to be proactively for something and the concept about blue communities was that ordinary people can come together and promote a vision and i think people loved the idea they were able to come together and put an argument together and go before their city council and 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 be directly involved in change that's positive for them and it was so popular here and it just when I went to Bern, Switzerland, oh, I guess now about eight or nine years ago, and I met the then oh, wonderful man at Stapet, his name was the mayor of Bern, and I told him about blue communities in Canada. He said, I love this. Can If we become a blue community, will you come back here? And I said, you bet. So the next year I came back and not only did the city of Bern become a blue community, the university became a blue community and the reformed church which is the major church all the major churches in in uh, switzerland and they now have a full-time coordinator blue communities coordinator in in uh, in switzerland so it really started to bubble up it the world council of churches which represents over 500 million christians all over the world they became a blue community and from a beautiful spiritual a place of spiritual reverence for nature and for Mother Earth, and they use the language of Mother Earth or the Creator. Uh, it's really quite lovely language that with which they introduce this, and so they're spreading it through their communities and faith-based groups um, around the world. Um, I think it's kind of like the Green New Deal in the sense that uh, maybe there was some kind of crossover in learning from being positive about something to being positive about, again. I mean, you could the climate crisis is so huge and we have to be critical of, of bad practices and bad policies. But when you put together a vision that's exciting for people that they can tap into, it's really wonderful. And I can remember speaking about this um, as I wrote a book on this too, my goodness, I've been writing books. It's called, Whose Water Is It Anyway? 
taking uh, water back into public hands. But um, I was in uh, Whistler at the book. Uh, oh, you got it there. I was in Whistler at the book, uh, their book literary festival just before COVID. And we had this lovely, so I had the event in the evening and the next morning there were walks in the mist, the beautiful mist in the rainforest there. And you would walk and talk with people. This was just part of what they asked you to do. So it wasn't all indoors. And this woman had heard me the night before and she said, guess what? And I said, what? She said, I've become a blue community. And I said, all by yourself. <laughs> she said, well, why not? She said, I never thought about bottled water. I drink it all the time. Trust me, I have had my last bottle of water. She said, I know nothing about the water crisis. I'm going to get involved. I'm going to learn about my municipality. I forget where she came from, a smaller community in BC, but she's going to, I'm going to learn. She, I had talked to them about the bottled water industry in British Columbia because it's really bad. It's really growing. A lot of uh, foreign investors coming in and getting rights to just put a drill down and take that water up. And believe me, uh, hand in hand with the water dis distress um, that's happening with fracking in British Columbia and in Alberta, but particularly in the north uh, east of British Columbia. The water situation there is a free for all. I mean, they really have to get their act together. This is not a province with water to spare, right? Um, and, and so she's, she, I talked about that the evening before. She said, I'm going to learn about this. I'm going to get involved. And I heard from her uh, several months later, she'd become involved with a local group that was fighting their, their, their own fight about um, uh, stopping a bottle of water taking uh, there. And so British Columbia has just announced that they're going to have a new process for licensing. Um, and again, this came from the bottom up. It did come from the top down. I mean, one of the things you learn, as you know, as an activist is that it doesn't usually, people don't give power away, right? It doesn't start at the top unless you're really lucky. It usually starts at the bottom and bubbles up. And once enough people are there, you can make change happen in an amazing way. So I've loved it because it's positive and we're just mm -hmm. launching a new project here in Ottawa, but hopefully around the world called Blue Schools. I want, I want schools to become uh, uh, blue. I want them to turn blue. And what we're looking at, and as a group of us, we're called Friends of Blue Schools. It's just as a group of educators and, and myself and a few others. Um, and we're looking at the whole notion of schools taking on um, a project where they teach. And again, it's connected to climate and they're learning lots about climate, but they're learning, not learning a lot about water, except that water is a victim of climate, right? But the three, the three ways in which you'd take a pledge would be that you'd educate your students on the human right to water, which we should talk about, by the way. Um, and on the water crisis itself, the ecological crisis, and, and that they would, the, the school would take a stand against bottled water. And in many schools, you know, the, the vendors come in and they put their vending machines right in front of the, the fountains, you know, they're awful. So to, to wean young people and to get kids coming home and saying to mom and dad, why are we drinking plastic bottled water? I mean, there are places where you don't have a cho choice, but here we have a choice. We have clean, safe water coming out of our tap. So um, I'd love to see this concept grow. And I, I, it gives people something to do. And Tina, this is what I feel so strongly about is that we, I worry about despair. I worry about young people in despair. I worry about my grandkids. This book that I wrote on, on just finished on hope, <clears throat> started at an evening event at a big old church in Ottawa on the Green New Deal um, in June 2019. And there were lots of speakers, well-known speakers and so on. But each one kind of got up and was really, you know, the sixth great extinction and the end of oceans. And it was like, oh my God. And there were a lot of young people in the room, <clears throat> including my 16-year-old granddaughter. And I can remember thinking, oh, hmm. So I got up and talked about hope and I talked about blue communities and I talked about things that people are doing. And that remember, you don't know all the good things that are doing. You can read all the bad things because they're coming at you every day, but you don't know what's happening and you don't know, you know, the crab sideways of, of uh, Rebecca Solnit. Um, and I remember at the end, these two young high school women, they were maybe grade 12, what came up and in tears. Thank you very much for talking about hope. If you hadn't talked about hope, I don't think one of them said, I wouldn't come back to another event like this. This is just like, I don't know what to do with this. And we know the Guardian last week had a big story 
for, for COP on, on polls it's taken on young people and the toll that this is taking. We have to give people things to do. As a, a friend of mine who has been fighting for food security and food sovereignty and, and wonderful work for years and years said, when, when he gets overwhelmed by things, you know, he says, what, I ask myself, what's the most appropriate next step to take? And I take it. And I love that because you can't do it all. And if you think you can do it all, or if you think that you're going to judge yourself by the outcome, you think too highly of yourself. You know, you by yourself are not going to change everything. It's, it's going to be a movement. And even then it may not change, or it may not change in ways that you understand at first or that you can see at first. So what's the next appropriate step to take? And uh, you know, the Buddhist belief that you give everything to the struggle that you're in, but that you disassociate yourself from the outcome to an extent that you, 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 you can't be responsible for it all. You know, you've got to trust that there's something else out there and uh, a, a force of, of goodwill. Um, so I think that hope is incredibly important, which I know your question was around blue communities, but I think that it's, it spreads to the whole movement to regenerative agriculture, ecological agriculture, you know, to regenerative soils, to the whole biodiversity uh, restoration. <clears throat> and I know we're, it's controversial around uh, uh, nature-based solutions because there's a lot of hijacking of that by the corporate sector, but the concept that we can in fact protect and restore our beautiful planet. Um, you know, and what are you doing and which is your piece and feeling that you're part of something as opposed to, it's just overwhelming. And yeah. uh, I, can't, I can't personally do anything because it's so big and I'm so small. And that, it's that togetherness that you felt on that march yesterday that's so phenomenal. I think I said to you in an email, I've been tear gassed on every continent except Antarctica. But yeah. it's really something to walk with a couple of hundred thousand people just being there together, caring together. Yes, yeah. And my takeaway from what you uh, just so eloquently said is that fear destabilizes, but hope mobilizes. And um, it's exactly that. It's that the Blue Communities Campaign is actually what introduced me to your work. I, I believe I was in junior high at the time. and. Um, it was a campaign in which, you know, folks were ordinary folks like myself, like my parents could do something. Mm -hmm. um, and it's exactly that that we need. Um, and I, ex I remember exactly around the Green New Deal tour, um, I was one of the speakers for the Halifax stop. And of course, David Suzuki was there and, you know, sharing about, you know, the great big extinction and, um, just the the overwhelming crisis that we're in and the questions that folks came up to me to say is, you know, what what do I do? How can I do something about this? And um, it's exactly right that our movements have uh, a need to learn um, how to instill hope um, so that we can mobilize people to um, win those changes. And I think the blue communities, the successes of that campaign is, is just that's the proof of it, um, is that ordinary people can do incredible things. Um, so thank you so much for talking about that. Um, actually, I wanted to go back um, to, to kind of what you were mentioning around, you know, the water crisis and, and human rights, um, which is, you know, what are the, I think oftentimes, especially when I was in, uh, in school is that, you know, we've been told Canada has an abundance of water. And again, you had said that, of course, of abundance. We, we very much don't, do not have an abundance of water. Um, and that more importantly, that the crisis wasn't necessarily within our borders, but that the crisis was happening in the global south in places where, you know, there's this siloing away. Um, and so, yeah, to connect kind of what are you know, the connections between the water and, and human rights. And of course, that um, idea of um, the myth of abundance here in Canada. Um, so yeah, we'd love to have you talk a little bit more about that. Well, <clears throat> three points that I want to make, <clears throat> I'll just I'll write them down. The first is <clears throat> that it is our responsibility if we are lucky enough to live in a wealthier country um, to make sure that our corporations act in a, in, a, in a way that's respectful 
when they are outside of our borders. <clears throat> and our mining companies in Canada are the worst in the world. We, you know, way, way more, I think it's like 70, almost 75% of all mine operations are, their companies are registered here because we have very lax rules. Um, and uh, when you think about oil and gas, I think about American companies more, but when you think about mining, they're Canadian and they are doing, not all of them, but most of them, terrible things in the global South, Latin America, uh, Central America, Africa, uh, our mining companies are our ambassadors and they're not good ambassadors. They dump their poisons into the water. They get access to this water rights for, for many years um, and are able to just do whatever they want. And by the way, just as an aside, that's also true in Canada. Under Harper, which did not get reversed under uh, Trudeau, the part of the Fisheries Act that was changed was reversed, but this part was not. And that is that a mining company can apply to the Canadian government to have a lake renamed uh, a tailing impoundment area. That's what it's called. And they can take that tailings impoundment area, which used to be a lake, and it's now not subject to the Fisheries Act, so they can dump whatever they want in it. It's just an outrageous thing. So it's not just far away, right? But mining companies in the global south, Canadian mining companies in the global south are doing terrible things. So their human right to water is incredibly important. And there have been some incredibly important breakthroughs. Um, though a book that was written by my colleague, uh, John Cavana and Robin Broad is called The Water Defenders. And it's about El Salvador and how the government of, of El Salvador took back control of the mining uh, of, of their land and their water because their water was being mined uh, and polluted to death by foreign mining companies. So, but that, so that's my first, the first thing I wanna say. The second thing is that this is why it's so important to have a human rights perspective on this. Um, pre the resolution at the United Nations, which was 20, July 28, 2010, I was there in the balcony. Uh, water was argued that water was a need that could be met by um, uh, charity or government handouts or government social programs, but it was not considered a fundamental right. <clears throat> it wasn't included in the 1948 Declaration of Human Rights because at the time it wasn't an issue, you know, but it became a huge issue by the 70s, 80s, and particularly the 90s, everybody knew. And so we started this movement to get the United Nations to recognize both drinking water and sanitation as fundamental human rights. And it was a breakthrough. And the person who put it to the UN was the then ambassador from Bolivia to the UN uh, General Assembly. His name is Pablo Solon. And he, we weren't sure at all we were going to win. We were, in fact, I thought we weren't. And I had a couple of my staff up in the balcony and we, they were deers and we're all kind of holding each other ready to lose and, but then, you know, try again. Uh, and but he just put this brilliant case to the people of the world and he said, you know, I, in a way I dare you vote against the human right to water and he held up a report <clears throat> that had just come out that in uh, the global south that every three and a half seconds a child dies of waterborne disease and he did this, you know, three and then a half, you could have heard a pin drop in the General Assembly of the, of the, of the United Nations. And we got that resolution. And since then it's been used in court cases. It's been used to change the constitutions of many countries, including for instance, Mexico. And then a long time, a couple of years ago, an attempt to start to privatize the water services. And our movement was able to say, no, 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 no. You just amended the constitution to say that water is a fundamental human right. And they backed off. I mean, we've had, we have something like four dozen countries now that have either amended their constitution or brought in a separate law uh, around the human right to water and sanitation. So, but it's it's not just in counting what's happened, it's that it gives you a different perspective. And I remember saying at the time, the, the people of the world came together and said, it, it's not acceptable for a, a person to have to watch their child die of waterborne disease. And we just made, it, I, I felt that we took an evolutionary step forward. Does that mean everything was okay? Of course not. We outlawed uh, torture in 1948 and horribly it still exists, but we collectively as a human family said it's wrong. And that to me was a, a, an incredible breakthrough. So my last point to that, of course, is First Nations here in Canada. And when I was advising 
the president of the General Assembly when we were getting ready for this resolution, the Canadian government, with, again, under Stephen Harper, was our biggest opponent. I was so mortified at the UN. People would say, could you do anything with your government? And I'd say, we're trying. I think the major reason that the Harper government did not support the human right to water and sanitation was because of the situation on First Nations in Canada. And they, they knew full well that people like me and you would say, aha, we now have this resolution at the UN. This is what it means. Um, I have to say, I give credit to the current government. I know it's not perfect and I know there's still lots to be done. But I shouldn't say even the government, I should say the Canadian people. I think there's been such a groundswell of support for an in incredible Indigenous leadership, incredible Indigenous um, articulation of the situation that I think there's, there we turned a corner. And I think it's something like in the last, since 2016, something like 107 long-term boil water advisories have ended. Now, everyone must end, don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting for a moment, but this is the first time as a Canadian people, we have really felt this. Kids, little kids in schools are all writing the prime minister saying, this is not acceptable. I mean, I know, I know because I speak, I do a lot of work in schools and I know these kids are, they're learning it. They weren't learning that even 10 years ago. And, and so there's my hope, okay, is that that the resolution, which now, by the way, is adopted by all member states uh, of the United Nations now, including Canada, of course, even though we opposed at the time. Uh, then we had UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which is even a step further because it recognizes collective rights, collective rights over resources. Um, resource management, who's coming into my territory, did you ask, you know, um, it, so, and just the whole notion that the concept of right can, rights can also be seen culturally, it's not just the Western notion of individual rights, very exciting stuff, and I, so, I'd say in all of my life, career, or whatever, that was the moment that Sean and I knew that the job's still ahead of us and we still, as I said, have the perfect storm of the declining water stocks and the growing inequality and the rising water prices. But it's like changing the lens on a camera. If this is what it was, nope, it's now this. It's a human right. And it's an issue of justice, not charity. And that is fundamentally different. Yes, yes, absolutely, yes. <laughs> um, Maude, I wish I could just pick your brain away for hours and hours, but um, I do want to open it up to some questions from uh, the participants. Uh, but before we get to that, um, I just wanted to mention two things, which is what of what you just said, which is that, um, yes, 75% of uh, the world's mining corporations are based in Canada. Um, and I, again, from my work with uh, migrant justice organizing, which is, of course, um, major aspect of, of these mining corporations displacing and dispossessing um, Indigenous and rural communities um, across the world, um, is that you know, as Canadian peoples, um, we have work to do in, in to stopping and al allowing those corporations to doing what they're doing. And your work as to essentially even the idea to me that water wasn't even seen as a human right from the very beginning is just, it's so disorienting because how do we, how do we survive? How do we, how, you know, it, it's just, it's incomprehensible and um, the fact that you know folks um, for decades and decades have been in this movement and has been in this fight um, to have that have water be recognized as a human right um, I just I just wanted to applaud you and and all the folks that you've worked with um, because um, it's just it's incomprehensible that uh, water wasn't seen as a human right before um, so anyway, I will. Um, and, and was actively fought. I mean, and was actively fought. Countries against. It wasn't just Canada. The United States was opposed. Great Britain was opposed. The World Bank was opposed. All the big water companies were opposed. All the big water utilities. All the bottled water companies. Peter Brabeck, who was then CEO of uh, of the water division of of Nestle, said that it was ridiculous to consider water human right and then after we adopted the after the UN adopted the resolution he said okay well all right he said 
I would put 1.5% of the world's population aside for the poor. And the rest of it goes on the open market for sale. It's like, oh my God, you know, it's just, yeah. But uh, it was a sweet win. It really was. It, yes. It's and by the way, with the mining companies, I think I even forgot to finish that statement. Our job here is to put pressure on our government to pass a law that holds our mining companies accountable in other countries. Because it's too often they'll say, well, we're going to hold you to some here. But you know, that's up to that country. Well, give me a break. You know, it's a small community up against what they're up against. They need, this is the, the role is, you know, you'll go into, you know this, Dina, because you've done international work and migrant work. The, the, the role often for activists in our country is to, is not go in and, you know, be supportive or whatever. It's to, they'll say, go home and hold your company's account. That's what you, that's, you want to do something for us? Get your, you know, get your companies in line and, and stop them and make it public in, in, in your country. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so Ash, I think Shannon is going to pop up the head and take it away for question and answers. Yes, thank you both very much. Um, Tina, you asked such thought provoking questions and Maud, everything that you've shared about your experiences and your work has been enlightening and motivating. Um, I think particularly your comments around the importance of hope will speak to a lot of us here today. Um, we do have a couple of questions that came in through the Q&A already. So to our attendees, um, if you do have questions, please do send them along, um, or you can also use the chat if you do prefer that function. Um, so our first question here is, when people try to discredit voices like yours, what have you seen to be the most powerful to counteract this doubt? Is it data, anecdotes, video, media coverage? Well, it depends if the, if the, and I'd love to hear Tina answer some of this too. It depends if the uh, criticism is valid. Sometimes you have, you know, we're human and we make mistakes. So you have to keep yourself open to maybe I didn't say that the best way I could, or maybe I didn't represent it <clears throat> as clearly as I could have, or, you know, you have to be open to that. However, if it's discrediting you because you're the messenger and they're after the message, um, then you just have to have some faith that if you're right, time will tell. Um, one of the things I talk about in my new book is, is self-care. And I think Tina will, will resonate and other activists will resonate to this because you can get deeply, deeply involved and you, you forget everything else. You just stop doing things for yourself, reading fiction, you know, going for walks, doing something other than just working um, because it's, it's, it's a tide, you can, you know, you'll never hold this tide of the work that needs to be done. You'll never hold it back. It's always going to be there and you have to find your place in it. So part of it is, is, um, <clears throat> trying not to get angry. My mother used to say to me, my, my late mother, she's a wonderful woman. The first time I was ever publicly criticized this is years ago, she, and I got all sulky and she said, uh, you cut that out. She said, serious people have serious enemies, which I've always loved because I was raised as a very proper girl child in the 50s and I was a middle child even worse of girls well, I was a little peacemaker right my mother said you've taken serious positions on things this is the price that comes with it so that was a lesson that I had to learn that I, I, I you know I think we're all still learning is how to take that um, <clears throat> but to <clears throat> to try my mother would say if I was on television don't yell at that man I know you feel like yelling at that man but don't because all people will see is your anger and they'll turn off. So let them do that. You be the calm one. <clears throat> you put it out the information. Yes, countering with information is incredibly important, but you know, you want to do it in bunches of ways. There are major reports. There are big books, but there are also pamphlets. There's, we have had, we've used comic books to tell a story where people who are busy and doing other things to read something that's, you know, then you can say, if you want to read more on it, here it is, but here's, here are the main points. <clears throat> Videos, uh, you know, uh, there's just so many ways that you can, you can tell a story um, to people and, and, and telling stories is really important. I do a lot of public speaking, uh, more before COVID, of course. 
um, but <clears throat> telling stories and making it human and telling the human the human impact of what's happening is incredibly important when when you're trying to uh, get your message out. And I, I was saying, and I remember saying in the book that I I kind of broke up my my life into the, my work life into the women's movement, the economic globalization, free trade movement, and then the the water justice movement, and look at they all come together to an extent, but you can almost see them distinctly. And I, I made the point that the women's movement part of it, I was with the tide. I mean, we were just on a roll and we weren't stopping, right? But when I got into the issue around economic globalization, fighting free trade, I was against the tide. Like it was, everybody was on board. Well, not everybody, but a lot of people, you know, the economic globalization would rise, all boats, the little ones and the big ones, everybody be happy, it would be good. And I say, yeah, yeah really now what the UN says that three quarters of the world's working population is in, is in the precariat. They don't have proper work, they don't have, proper salary they don't have security is that what you meant by all the boats rising at once i think those yachts rose really well i think most of the rest of us did not so and again this is part of the answer if be patient if you're right time will tell and you have to be there with a vision of what the alternative is and putting that vision out is incredibly important that's why people like blue communities i think mm -hmm. yeah and i'll just add a couple points which is um just to echo what what Maud said is that I think you know whenever we make a position and we you know stick strong to that position there will always be people to kind of discredit or people to deny that but at the same time we also have to believe that we're right and we are right we are on the right side of history um and I think it's essential that we also understand that the reason why we're here is because folks like Maud folks even before MOD have paved the way for us and that um, we are building on an analysis and we're building on a framework um, that has kept on winning and that, um, you know, it, this is a continuation of that work. So I'll add that there. Thank you. Um, we have another question here. How can ordi ordinary Canadians hold mining companies accountable when they continue to commit crimes against water defenders in the global south? Does the jurisdiction make this difficult? How do we circumvent this? Is it through the conception of water as a human right? Um, I want Tina to answer this too, because I know Tina's done work on this. We had a private member's bill, Peter Julian, the NDP uh, had a private member's bill ready last parliament. It was about, I guess it's been about two years and he was getting a lot of support so that it would be a legislation that would hold mining Canadian mining companies accountable. Um, and uh, I guess it died when uh, the election took place, but it really, we need legislation on this. I mean, there are lots of Lots of ways to get the information out. Work with Mining Watch Canada, go to their website, go to the website of a group called Rights Action. They're doing incredible work right as we speak in Guatemala <clears throat> with uh, people who are fighting a mining company that used to be Canadian that's done terrible things there. Um, get yourself knowledgeable. Uh, Mining Watch and Rights Action and others will have lots of suggestions for you. But we really do need legislation. Um, and again, one of the messages around hope is not to do things by yourself, but to always uh, find organizations or others who are doing this kind of work um, to work with them. But I'm sure um, Tina has thoughts on this too. Yes, and I mean, something that I always try to say whenever I um, am speaking publicly is is that quote of you know 75 percent of mining corporations are based in Canada I don't think the average Canadian knows that and I mean even just that alone is it's it's embarrassing but it's also extremely frightening there is a reason why corporations choose Canada to base their operations here and again as Maud said it's because of the the very flimsy legislation that allows them to get away with the you know um, most horrendous abuses that are going on in in places around the world um, and of course when the work that I do with migrant justice is, is that uh, when Canadian mining corporations you know, commit these horrible abuses, um, folks are displaced, folks are dis 
dispossessed and now they need somewhere to go. And so the work that we do with No One Is Illegal is to essentially um, create the conditions so that when they do arrive to places like Canada, that they have, you know, the status, they have um, the health care and the education and all the, the rights that they're entitled to um, when they do come to to the border. And so the work that we do is it's committed to solidarity with working with those migrant communities and understanding that um, we are living in a globalized world where, you know, the things that are happening here are very much happening elsewhere and that we have to kind of tie those together and um, keep that going. And um, it is absolutely, it's, it's a difficult situation, but again, with legislation and I think, of course, holding those corporations accountable um, really making it known that, um, you know, Canada, the government allows them to get away with these, these abuses is um, something that we, we really need to be more vocal about. Thank you. Um, we have a question and a comment here. Uh, thank you, Maud, Tina, and Halifax Public Libraries. Thank you, Maud, in particular, for talking about hope and giving people things to do. I am a high school science teacher. Very often in schools, students learn a bit about climate change, water issues, and sustainability, and are encouraged to take small individual actions to reduce their environmental impact. This is a good start, but I don't want to give my students a false impression that shorter showers and household recycling are the best ways to create large scale global change. What are your strategies for giving youth the understanding and tools to become politically active and affect meaningful progress towards sustainable water management? <clears throat> well, again, I really want to hear with, with Tina because that's exactly what Tina is doing in Glasgow, not just watching the, how much water she uses when she brushes her teeth, but being part of a movement. It is a political, as you know, I'm sure uh, the teacher asking this already knows because, because it's such a political, politically aware question, but we need to teach, you know, the notion of civic responsibility. You are responsible, not just for, to caring about your own family and your own surroundings, but you know, the whole planet, or as a little prince says, exuberates is when he gets up the morning after he bathes, he must tend his planet. You know, we, we have that notion that, that we are responsible for something beyond ourselves. And again, that's very, very much part of Indigenous teaching is that it's not just looking after your immediate family, but <clears throat> all your relations, right? Um, <clears throat> but that's why we're liking the concept of blue schools because it challenges the students to think about what they can do. And we started with a, um, an elementary school here in, in Ottawa called Hopewell. Uh, two of my grandkids went there, so that's kind of where I got interested. But some teachers there were really interested, and they got the kids doing fabulous projects from art to science to um, uh, getting involved with the, the Fridays, the, the um, you know, the uh, just right. not just as the when uh, anyway, you know, the Friday uh, mo movement of the, of the young people. Um, they, they, but they've made that they've made the connection. These kids themselves have made the connection, and they're really excited about it. And what they were hoping, and then COVID came along, was that they were going to become a, the first blue school. They were going to get logo and everything, and take it out to other kids. And they wanted to go to the local stores and put a, a, a blue drop in it, which says basically that you can come in and get some water. You don't have to use bottled water. You can have. You'll have. Um, tap water for you here, not just restaurants, but just there's going to be a place for you to have access to water. Um, just they came up with these great ideas. Um, and uh, so I, I it's, it's not just teaching it in the flat sense. And I know that I, there's nothing the oil and gas companies would like better than to dump a you know, uh, a bunch of uh, taxes, higher taxes on oil and gas so that the poorest people just are going to be hit the hardest, but they doesn't touch their production, right? Of course they like it. Um, and, and they, you know, they're going to convince you to try to do this and that and get a solar panel here, or as you say, turn the water off when you're brushing your teeth, not going to cut it. But there's nothing better than making us feel that we individually are the bad ones. We're individually responsible for our, in our bad behavior. And meanwhile, they get to continue to pollute. So, it, so I love your, the teacher's uh, question. And I, I wish I had a teacher like that when I was in, in elementary school. 
Yes, yeah, exactly, Maud. Um, and what I what I would say is too is that this is ultimately this is about power, and that these corporations they would love nothing more than to have you know ordinary people think and assume the responsibility that we as individuals cause this crisis, these compounding crises at hand. And of course we have to take responsibility. And, and of course that's why, you know, we're, we're joining these movements and we're creating this collective change. But um, more importantly, more importantly than individual responsibility is a collective responsibility that we need to take and that we need to build a movement together. And, um, you know, things like turning off the water or, you know, or turning off the lights or, you know, taking a bike to work um, just simply is not going to cut it and that corporations would love nothing more than for us to think that those would be the solutions. Um, so, of course, at the end of the day, this is about power and that these corporations, these massive, you know, profit making um, machines um, would, um, you know, would um, they, yes, they would just love nothing more than than um, folks and taking take responsibility for it. Exactly. Not yes. your fault. It's my fault. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. What should water slash watershed protection look like in policy policy and legislation, especially in a province like Nova Scotia, where the government has said that they are planning to strengthen water protection? Well, <clears throat> again, Tina is going to have some thoughts there, um, but it's, we absolutely need um, strong legislation around watershed, uh, watershed protection in terms of uh, runoff. We need local, we need local laws around uh, access to water and, and ways for communities to make community decisions around who should have access. Um, I helped write the, a groundwater legislation for Vermont because this person with wonderful woman with the Vermont Natural Resources Council had heard me speak and I said you know most groundwater is not protected in the United States or Canada is not protected by public trust law and she went back to her organization and she said that's not true is it and they said yeah there's absolutely no it's a free-for-all um, so what we did we wrote legislation that was very clear that in times of any kind of shortage or crisis or you know, debate around water, there are three priorities, water for people's needs, so the, you know, the water you need day to day, uh, water for the ecosystem, and this was interesting, water for local food production, so not for massive export. Now, I'm not saying it, uh, uh, Nova Scotia is necessarily into that, but certainly many, many places are into to using water um, to grow crops that, that they then sell far away. It's called virtual water. And that's the water that's used um, to produce something. It might be cattle, it might be rice, it might be almonds or whatever. And then once that water, once that product commodity is shipped away, so is the water. So we really have to take, we really have to look very, very carefully at where water is being used and how it's being used. And I know the Alton gas uh, fight was just incredible. It's incredible that we won that fight, that uh, it's now a decommissioned project. And this was a real, as, as um, Tina said, it was led by First Nations and particularly the women leaders, but it was also a community fight. It was people just, just got what was wrong with it. And uh, we're going to have to um, take a look at, at uh, the projects for water takings um, in community after community. And we need strong laws at the top, both federally and provincially, that set out the values um, of ecosystem protection and uh, the human right to water. Yeah. Um, I mean, not much more to add than what Mar uh, Maud just explained, but um, I think especially so is that what excites me about this question is it reminds me of the Blue Communities Campaign, which is that, you know, Halifax has the very real potential to be a Blue Communities Campaign. And that's a very, very possible and uh, tangible way that ordinary people can start, you know, creating that bottom up change uh, that eventually, you know, goes up to legislation and, um, and yes. Thank you. Um, 
I, I'd like to ask one of my own questions, if I can. Um, that's, that's all we have right now from our audience. So if there are any more, please do submit them. Um, but in the meantime, I'm wondering if um, either or both of you could speak to some of the sort of specific water considerations for either in Halifax or in Nova Scotia. I know um, you mentioned Alton Gas, which was just very recently in the news. Um, but are there other issues either past or ongoing that you feel would be important for locals in our communities here to um, become more informed about? Yeah, I think that's a great question, Shan. Maybe I can start with this one and then pass it off to Maud. Um, so I think, you know, the one of the major um, crises and, and situations that we're seeing, especially in, in the local context of Nova Scotia is um, Northern pulp. Um, so, you know, um, there's effluent, le you know, leaking into the water and have been for decades and the local communities just, you know, this lake was such an, you know, essential um, part of a relation to their communities and um, a corporation has gone in dumping effluent into their waters um, and that's, you know, disabled their ability to fish and to, to be around um, and to celebrate. Um, and so that's definitely a huge ongoing fight and has been for Essex. Um, and um, one other one other mention that I wanted to bring up that I wasn't able to is that, of course, even the attack on Mi'kmaq fishers um, last year, and of course ongoing, is, is that when Indigenous peoples are not allowed to steward um, their lands, their waters, that is also a water issue. Um, and so, you know, seeing the connections as to, as to um, Indigenous communities being able to steward, you know, the lands and the waters that have been theirs since time immemorial, I think, um, are, are definitely um, local uh, situations that, you know, we should be in solidarity with and, and to keep working on. Yeah, and I know we're coming to the end of our time, but I would just, um, again, in the spirit of hope, uh, remember the Sydney tar ponds, which was awful. Uh, remember Elizabeth May when she before she was a member of parliament when she was back with the Sierra Club said you got to come here and see it and it was like a moonscape you couldn't you could a moonscape where we dumped all the garbage on earth it was just the slag from the from the from the hundred years of 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 uh of steel making was just appalling and we thought it was impossible to fix Elizabeth and I decided to write a book we called it um uh, Frederick Street, Life and Death on Canada's Love Canal, because it was all about the, the frontline people. And we would go door to door. They had a map of the neighborhood that was right there and all the different cancers in every single house that was a different cancer, right? And we talked, we told one story about this guy who got up in the night to get a glass of water and he knew everything so well he didn't have to turn the light on and his dog had been out in, you know, pedaling around in the tar ponds, came back in and was glowing in the dark. This dog was glowing in the dark. And we talked about lilacs that turned black and fell off, you know, I mean, it was poison. Um, and it took a long time. We had the most wonderful time writing that book because we talked to the, the workers, retired workers who worked there for years and just the stories about, you know, you'd know you were getting cancer and you wouldn't be allowed to stop because there was no, there was no sick leave, there was no compensation. I mean, it was just like, you, you'll work there till you die kind of thing. Uh, just unbelievable um, human story. And, you know, the community came together, eventually put pressure on to the point that, that it's, you know, how, how much damage is still being done, I suppose, is going to be told over time because you know you don't remediate something like that so so easily but that was considered one of the worst polluted sites on earth um and so we can make a difference and i guess the the really important story here is that when we come together and we make a vow and we make a commitment and it's based on knowledge um, and it takes a long time we can move mountains we move the mountain slag in uh, on steel in uh, in sydney nova scotia Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm also going to put in the chat here for anyone who is interested a link to the library catalog that has uh, the Frederick Street book that Maud just referenced, as well as um, other works by her, if anyone does want to pursue um, some of those books further. 
Um, we have about five minutes left and just had two new questions come through the chat. So we'll see if we can address both of those. Uh, the first one is, what can we do to stop our governments, provincially as well as federally, from selling off our precious green areas um, to private investors that will destroy them? I'm citing an area such as Owl's Head that have not just rare plants and animals in them, but have areas that are necessary for water preservation, boglands, eelgrass, et cetera. Um, our former provincial government did this behind closed doors and the newly elected provincial government isn't addressing it. And the last thing we need is another golf course, especially on an area like this. Maybe what's your other question and we can see if we can do them together because we're coming sure. up to time now. Sure. Um, hi, Maud. Great to see you and thank you for your presentation and insights. Have your associates here in Nova Scotia taken a public stand against the large international corporation Atlantic Gold and its intentions for open pit mining in support of the NOPE campaign that is trying to protect the St. Mary's River watershed? Thank you. Um, I'll go maybe to the last one because I know we have to wrap up and that is that I would send you to the website of the Council of Canadians in, in Halifax to, and, and, and have you direct your question there because I've retired from the organization so I'm not into the, into the details of, uh, but I know we had taken a position uh, on it and I think that relates to the first question which is don't do this by yourself, find an organization to get involved with. Um, there are many of them and, and join uh, in uh, with the campaign. If there isn't any, then you may have to start it. And I've started many organizations in my life, including the Council of Canadians. And it's really, um, you know, you can do it, but it's all, you can't do it by yourself. So working together is incredibly important. And I know, um, give a minute to, in a second to, uh, um, to, to uh, Tina, but I just want to end my part of it with a great quote from Banksy, the wonderful street artist in uh, England who says, if you, if you are tired, learn to rest, not to quit. Yes, that's a beautiful quote. And I, I think that's a perfect end to the, uh, to the evening. Um, but absolutely, it's that we cannot do this alone. And so, you know, get your friends, get your neighbors uh, and, and start, you know, Halifax can be a blue communities campaign and, or a city and, um, it's a, an incredible way for us to get involved with that. Well, my personal heartfelt thanks to both you, Maud and Tina, uh, for your time sharing your expertise um, and learning with us all. Um, and a big thanks on behalf of Halifax Public Libraries and all of the attendees here today. Thank you, lovely, lovely day. Really appreciated it. Tina, go for a march for me. <laughs> yes, absolutely. You're here with me in spirit. Thanks I so much. Again. Bet I am. Wonderful to speak to you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.